kick off, please share then your, your morning thought reflection. And uh, we'll just basically take it from there. Thanks, Mr. Kunene. So that morning thought is that we must build our strength emotionally and mentally because we have battles to fight and we must conquer them will not be overcome by what we can conquer. If we need to be stubborn against anything, we must be stubborn against losing. We are born to win over the abstract battles, and with each battle we win, we move on a step closer to being stronger. We must become invincible. Most importantly, we must be compassionate towards those who are going through the most without adding to their struggle. We are created to love. It's not an option. It's a must. I'm not sure if you're reading something that I wrote. It, it just <laughs> <laughs> You know, Mr. Kunene, when you wrote that article, yeah. it was on the 1st of August. So I was going through some challenges at work uh, between myself and some of my colleagues because, you know, I was labeled as one who favor certain individuals in the team. And subsequent to that, within a short period of time, there were staff members, part of my team, they lost their, their, their beloved, so people that are closer to them. And I also use that message just to strengthen the people. Because I think what you highlighted in that message, if I have to break it down, the first yeah. part of what resonated with me is that challenges will always be there. The, the, the question is that, how do we prepare for those challenges? And in my view, you don't prepare for challenges when you are in the midst of the storm. It's what you do before the storm to make sure that when the storm comes, you are facing the eye of the storm, you'll be able to go through that. You, you highlighted the mental aspect and the emotional aspect, and all that, if I look at a human being, you know, when you talk about a human being in his capital nature, being a soul, a spirit, and a body. So what you highlighted there is that most of the battles, we need to make sure that from a soul's perspective, you are prepared to be able to overcome those particular challenges. Because what you see in the physical is most of the time the manifestation of what we carry inside. So yes, sure. that, that message was put together by you, that is why when I saw that message on that particular day, you know, it, uh, it reminded me that the battles is not without, but the battle is within. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting that you would also refer to that in terms of battle. And yet again, this morning's uh, morning thought is again about battles. But I think the most important thing, the one that I want to also talk uh two is is the part about preparing for battles when you are not in it mm -hmm. that you need to prepare yourself um in advance and i'm a firm believer in in making things practical for people so in your opinion how would you say someone can prepare for battle or prepare for challenges in advance before they get to that stage yeah, so I think it, it talks to, 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 to two things in my view. So the first thing that it talks about is identity. So it's understanding what is a human being. And uh -huh. I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier on to say, as a human being, you are a spirit and you live in a body. So because most of us, we suffer from identity crisis, we don't know who we are. Uh, we normally focus on the outward parts, being the body, rather than focusing on the spirit. And mm. when I go to the spirit as well, I normally break it into twofold. I'm saying there's the spirit being that connects to God. So yes. when you are a Christian, when you receive Christ as the Lord and Savior, that's what gets regenerated. Then the second part of the spirit is the conscious part of the spirit being the soul where you've got the faculty of expression where you talk about the mental part where you talk about the emotional part and there's the will part 
And you know what we do most of the time. You see people got a routine every day. They wake up at five o'clock, they hit the, the road so that they can prepare the physical person. They yeah. choose what type of food they eat so that they can prepare the physical person. We go to discam or to clicks, we buy vitamins so that we can boost our immune system. So as human beings, we know what is expected from us to build the physical person. Where we are not taught, it is how to build a spiritual man. Because if you build a physical person, you're anticipating that you know that one day I'll be sick, and when I get sick, my immune system must be strong enough. The same applies with the spiritual man. All that we need to do is also we need to develop a discipline. Every day we need to wake up. You need to make a connection with our maker on a daily basis. If you are a Christian, on a daily basis you devour the weight because the Bible is very clear. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And yes. which means that you eat bread on a daily basis in preparation. The third aspect, what we need to do is that, you know, I'm a strong believer of the secret place. Uh, when, even when you go to my WhatsApp, you'll see that my, uh, my icon is around the secret place. And it means that where you go into solitude and it's just between you and God and you commune with God, there, where you are not interrupted, where you are not looking for a group. Because in my view, I strongly believe that if you make that and inculcate that as part of your daily disciplines, where you go to the secret place alone, there's a song in Sesotho, mm-hmm. and so to me, that's where I draw my strength. You know, that's where I get inspiration. I know that, you know, currently I'm studying the book of John and the Bible says, uh, in the, in, in the Bible, they say, as it was his custom, Jesus will leave the crowd and he'll go to a solitude place. And most of the time, he'll even leave his disciple. It was mm. just between Jesus the man and God the Father. So in my view, that's how you prepare for those challenges. Because if you do not build that spiritual muscle, like you build a physical muscle, then challenges descend upon you. Affliction comes upon you. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, if you are weak in the day of crisis, you are weak indeed. So it's what you do before the battle, not when you're in the battle. So that's how, that's a long answer to your question to say, how do you prepare for the battle? What are the practical things? And I was just drawing the parallel between the physical and between the spiritual. Do that in the physical. If we can translate that into the spiritual, then we'll have that strength from an emotional and mental perspective that you reference in the morning code when you go through those challenges. That's fantastic. Um, you know, it. I, lo- I love it when when we can take something that is abstract and also make it tangible. That when in in order to prepare for the spiritual battle or to be spiritually strong, one needs to f- to also learn from the physical. I think there's a scripture in the Bible, Romans 120, for the physical, for the thing, what? How do I forget this now? Um, since the creation of time, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen and being understood by the things he created, right? So what is in the spirit God has created examples for us in the natural or in the physical. So in order for us to understand both, we, in order for us to understand the spiritual, we just need to look to the physical. So when we know that if there are those who run um, the ultra marathons, yes. right, when somebody knows what the ultra marathon requires, they will spend a lot of time training themselves to endure for each and every aspect of that marathon. Um, they, they will be so committed to that journey or to that training program, to that marathon that by the time it comes, they are both mentally and physically ready. But it's interesting that in, in, in the Bible, God says, uh, Jesus actually says, 
um, when the storms of life come. He doesn't say if, but he says when the storms of life come, right? So that means storms of life are guaranteed. So that means the battles are guaranteed to come. So if we are to then take that, how do we prepare ourselves? We need to think about it as an ultra marathon. Mm -hmm. How do I prepare myself both physically, mentally, spiritually, and otherwise for those spiritual battle? Because it's not like we shield it, you know? Mm. Um, we know that, uh, I think it's uh, Simon's, you know, it's uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes. He says, in, in corporate, as, as you go up higher, they pay you more. Yeah. The higher you go, the more they pay you. But they don't just pay you. They pay you for the challenges and the, and the challenges that you are going to face. So the higher the, the pay, the higher the challenges, and you must rise towards those challenges. You must rise as the pay rise. So basically, when we want to get paid more, we also need to be prepared for what comes with that role. Now, Baba Kunen, just to paraphrase what you say, they say in a corporate environment, you get paid at the level that you are able to solve problems. So yeah. if you want to solve small problem, uh, it's going to reflect in your salary. To solve big corporate problems, then you'll be paid at a higher level. And, and I think one of the things that you are not taught correctly at foundation stage is to shy away from problems. So, yeah. you know, the more I study the Bible, because, you know, I once had a discussion with you, but it was offline, it was not here, around being a student of success. And yes. being a student of success, I normally go to my Bible and I look at Abraham as an example to say, you know, for him to be called the father of faith, he had to go through a lot of problems. Because the heavenly father, when he had appeared to him, he said, I'm going to separate you from your family, from your kindred, and I'm going to go and show you a place that you have never seen. And you know, Adam went there without understanding what they did take. And most of the time, when you go through problems as well, we don't know the full picture because uh, nature and God reveal the challenges in a piecemeal format. You know, Abraham first was to go to a land that he did not know. The second thing, when he got there, he discovered that the wife is barren. After he discovered that the wife is barren, then there were some surrounding uh, nations that attacked him and he did not even provoke them. So it was an unprovoked attack. But in all those things, he managed to keep his focus, to say, at the end of the day, I know that whatever I'm going through is a means and there's an end. So that is why even ancient uh, wisdom say, uh, count it all joy when you go through all tribulation. And it goes and unpack what you gain out of tribulation. It is not the tangible things, but it's things like patience. It is things like character. And at the end of the day, if you mature those virtues as an individual, you are able, again, to overcome all these challenges in life. So I think maybe we need to be retaught to say, having challenges is not a bad thing. You must always have the mental discipline to your point or the mental muscle and the spiritual muscles to know that no man, whatever I'm going through, there are two expressions in the Bible. They say it shall come to pass. And after that, it has come to pass. So there's a pre and there's an after. So all that we need to do is to teach ourselves. And to your point, like you are using athletes, you know, studying the guys like we say in Bolt as an example. And they say, they get surrounded by somebody who trains them physically, but they get surrounded by somebody who trains them psychologically as well, to say the race is not only won on the field, but it is what goes on between your two ears when you are going through that particular race. Yeah, yeah, no. Thank you for that. Um, 
You know, there's a, there's another part on the morning thought that I want to touch on. Mm -hmm. We are born to win over the abstract battles in which it, with each battle we win, we move one step closer to being stronger. Um, I think, when was it? Yesterday, we were watching the movie um, Kiss and Cry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on this lady, young lady, Kali, who who faced a, a battle against cancer. And throughout, she, she kept a positive attitude. She kept this strong, lively personality. And in the midst of her challenges, she still gave to others through song, through blogging, through different things. But the biggest thing that I I remember or that I was reminded of was the many survivors of cancer who have gone through and once they've gone through chemo, they, they say cancer is in remission. And once cancer is in remission, they start to celebrate, thinking, yes, it's over. But then it comes back again. Um, and at first, most of them, I think, from what I've seen and observed, is that initially when the results of the cancer coming back, it kind of tends to feel, oh, again, this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then somehow they prepare themselves again for, for the same battle. But because they know that they've conquered the previous bout, they can conquer this one again. And so with each victory, they keep being stronger mentally, even though it's draining, I'll admit. Yes. But there's a thing about winning a battle that prepares you for the next one. If if you're the type of person who, who enjoys battles um, and you know that you've conquered one before, you kind of stand and say, I'm ready for the next one, you know? And when the next one comes, you kind of say, I'm ready, let's go. And you stand and you fight. And when you win that one, it gives you greater confidence. But then your mind is kind of uh, now prepared for something even bigger, you know? Something even more challenging because you kind of feel, okay, but I did conquer that one. So bring something better than this. Is this all you've got? You know, so there's a thing about not giving up that empowers you. There's a thing about not surrendering to how tough the battle is. As, as Deuteronomy 33, 25 says, um, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Mm -hmm. So with each day that you enter into, you already have the strength for it. It's not too much, it's not too little, but it's just pitched for that day. Sure. Baba Kunena, I don't remember where did I see this expression, and they call it muscle memory. Uh, so uh, they say, yeah, you, you build, uh, for every victory that you go through, you build that muscle memory. So every time when you go through challenges, you've got a reference point to say that, I've been here before, and I'm able to conquer that. You know, when you look at the sports fraternity, uh, I follow soccer, so my team is Orlando Pirates. But what was interesting about this year, it was the battle between Keza Chiefs and Sundowns. Because Keza Chiefs, for a long period of time, they commanded the summit position. But yeah. on the day, when it matters the most, the team that came out at the top, it was Sundowns. And the reason that Sundowns emerged as winners on that particular day is the muscle memory to say that you have played in Africa. You have done this before. You have been four times champion. You have done this before. So to your point, referencing uh, the lady and using the, the cancer scenario, it is that you go through these things, you conquer, then somewhere in your DNA, you've got that memory to say, I've done it before. When somebody throws something at you as well, you are able to go back to your memory and retrieve 
that reference point and it gives you strength to be able to overcome certain things. And yes. even, even in the Bible, to your point, you know, when I look at the story of David, because like I said, I like to study characters. For David to conquer Goliath, he did not get it on that particular day. He also had a muscle memory to say, at one day when I was looking at my father's flock, a bear came. I killed that bear. The other time, it was a lion. I killed that particular bear. So Goliath, it was just what was being seen uh, in the public, but in private, he was building that uh, muscle memory. And on the day when everybody was timid, he was able to say, you know what? I've got this uh, muscle memory. Also, I've got a covenant, and I know that who I work with will never disappoint me on this particular day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing that you would talk about David. Um, I, I read the book by Malcolm Gladwell, David and yes. Goliath. Yes. And then I, I watched a clip where Malcolm Gladwell talks about the story of David and Goliath, but not the book in its entirety, just that story. Mm. Um, without going too much into it, it's amazing that David had certain weaknesses that the Israelites didn't know about. Um, but muscle memory had to come into strength. David had to come with the, the preparation from, from where he was. He had to come with the faith in God that he had. He had to come prepared as well for battle because he had the slingshot and then he took the stones. Mm. So he came prepared, but little did everyone else around him or at that time understand and know that God had already positioned Goliath in a, in, in a position of weakness, placed Goliath in a position of weakness. And David, even without the stone, he was still in a position of strength because Goliath had certain, what can I say, um, challenges. He could not see properly. Um, because of his, his, his level of growth, he was not just a giant because he was a giant, but there were certain things that were playing. So that meant his sight was not good. And that's why he wanted David to approach him very close, right? So the point is, we may never know how strong we are and what we have in our background until we have to step up to the battle. And we may never know how already defeated the enemy is when we go to the battle um, if we don't step up to it. We may never know what the day has for us if we never wake up, get dressed, and be ready to face the day, Ooh. right? So we may never know all of those things if we simply think, okay, I've been told I've got a disciplinary hearing at work today, so I've been issued with a letter, everything has been arranged. I know they're going to dismiss me, so why bother? Mm. But if we dress up and say, I know the God in whom I believe, I know the God I serve, and because I know this God, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get dressed and I'm going to show up because his word tells me that I must show up. I must not worry what I'm going to say, but I must just show up and he will speak through me. Right. Mm. So the important thing and the important point to draw out of this is that we must never conclude defeat when we have not even gone to the battle. Mm. We must show up, you know. Um, David showed up and, and what you said is he added the testimonies. He said, I've done this, I've done that. But also the most important point is that he refused to take on tools that he was not familiar with. Mm. So, so you and I are believers. There are other people who would go to Inyanga or Rizangoma. Um, there are other people who would go to um, different people to consult, right? But you will never know how strong you are until you believe in what you believe in. Go with what you believe in and step up to the plate. 
don't allow what you think things will turn out and just give up. We must show up. You know, Baba Kunene, you have mentioned some powerful things that you say. When you look at the story of David, uh, he prepared, he stepped up, and also to your point, the enemy had weaknesses. And he knew that, you know, that, you know some of the things that you have articulated there. And I think one of the things that I've learned very well, uh, they say, from a Christian background, we've got two prayer warriors. One prayer warrior is our mind. The other prayer warrior is our mouth. So yeah. you say, we need to make sure that both are at sync. Whatever, cause whatever we confess, it must come from a deeper place. It must not be because we want to play to the crowd and we say things for the sake of uh, tickling people's ear. Cause that is why the, uh, when you study the Bible, you say above all, guard your heart. You know, the word that heart goes back to what you are saying is your emotions, your, your mentality. You guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it springs the issues of life. So everything that we see uh, manifesting in your life, it was birthed or it was conceived in the womb of your heart. And if you don't guard that, everything that you see in a physical form, it's going to be as a result of that. Again, going back to the cancer story, going back to the morning thoughts to say, how do you make this thing practical? And again, I'm saying, uh, John C. Maxwell have a nice way of putting say, success is found on your daily agenda. It is not big things that we do over a period of time. It is incremental. You are uh, mentioning uh, Gladwell Maxwell, he's got this outlier where he talks about people that we see now, you know, being great tennis player, being great uh, musicians, when you go back and you study that daily routine is that all what you are seeing now as an outward manifestation, it was incubated over a long period of time where nobody was watching you. You know, one pastor make a simple example. It's like, it's like when you're having a phone, uh, charging a phone is not a fancy thing, but if you don't charge your phone, the next day you won't be able to receive calls. So that's how we research ourselves mentally. So what do we do when nobody's watching? You plug in your phone, you charge it to make sure that next day you are prepared to receive your WhatsApp, to receive your calls. So it is what we do to our emotions, to our mind, to our spirit that is going to help us. Like you say, David did not just wake up. And you know, when you study even the life of David, it means that he was a very quiet guy. Because even when they came to his father, Jesse, when he paraded his boys, David was not in the picture. Only when he was mm -hmm. nursed, say, ah, this is the only boss that you have. He said, hey, I've got a young skinny guy. He's busy looking after my flock and they call him. And that's the boy that was anointed. But the only time that he revealed his muscle memory, it is when he was saying, no, I'm ready to do to, to, to this guy. Thank you. You know, you, coming back to muscle memory, you're touching on, so you're reminding me of something that's also powerful, that... You cannot have muscle memory, memory when you've not faced up to any battle. You, you cannot have muscle memory of winning when you've never won anything. Um, and then it ties back to this poem that I once read and which I've come to also love because of the profound lesson it carries. It's a poem by Elizabeth Bishop uh, titled One Art. Um, where she then says, for us to learn to accept loss on a bigger scale, we must have started on a smaller scale. So if you want muscle memory of winning, take on the smaller battles. Mm. Once you win the small battle, you have the confidence. And once you have the confidence, you go to a slightly bigger battle and then you go, you graduate bigger and bigger. And, and when you look, at, you, you look at numbers as well, numbers are very interesting. You start out from zero, and then you start counting from one up to nine. 
when you get to 10, you're reaching a different level. But then when you get to nine, you, you end a particular level and then you start another one where it's a one and a zero. So you're starting another level and then you go up to 20, another level. So with each level, there's addition, right? So the digits increase from single to double to triple to, uh, to quadruple and so on. So we must start with the small battles. And life, the, the one thing that we miss about life is that it does not um, immediately or the first battle that we tackle at life is not always the big battle. We are always given the small ones and then with those small ones, depending on how we face up to them, if we run from them, we'll always be facing another small battle. Until we learn to conquer the small battle, we will always be faced with small battles. And once we conquer the small battles, we then grow to bigger ones. And then when we face up to those and win, then again we grow. And then one day we realize, I'm fighting the biggest battle of my life. Mm or so it seems right yes but now yes. we've built up muscle memory and we think this is the biggest battle of our lives and lo and behold after winning that battle we are faced with another one mm. which is much bigger than the one we've had before so it's important for us to start small to face up to the small ones to tackle them, to win them, so that we create that muscle memory. And when we create the muscle memory, we then move to bigger ones. But most of us, we face a battle and then we shy away. Or we face a battle and then we kind of, okay, beat me down, it's fine. You know, we, we don't take that standing position that I'm going to fight. You see, Baba Kunene, when we grew up, our parents uh, used to say, don't leave the room up until you have made up your bed. You know, at face value, it looks like there are no learnings to be extracted from that particular example. But the most important thing, talking about the 5 a.m. club, is that before you go and face the bigger world then, you must conquer certain things. You know, waking up every day, making up your bed before you do anything is victory on its own because yeah. you have overcome uh, laziness. You know, one guy teaches about taking cold shower early in the morning. That's a victory on its own because the norm is to use a hot shower. You are using a cold power. You are saying, my body, you are going to take instruction from my mind. You know? Waking up every day and spending time in solitude, that's a victory on its own. So to your point to say starting small and being a practical person that you are, is to do those things. You know, when you say, people say, but why are you shouting at your child? You say, no, they left the room and they've not uh, made that bed, which means that they've not tasted victory that particular day. So by sending them back to that room, to go and they've made that bed, you say, taste victory. You say, before taking a cold shower is tasting victory and to your point that's how you build that uh, muscle memory to say no even today even though i know that there are bigger challenges that right now there but if i sleep at the end of the day and i take my gratitude journal and i start to pen things down i say no this day i've achieved i managed to take a cold shower my room was very clean i spent time in his presence i was able to commune and maybe you are meeting two clients, it adds to your uh, gratitude journal, it goes to your corporate memory because you have penned it down. So you, you are so right to say, if we don't build that, or if we don't create challenges for ourselves on that particular day, whether you are working or you are not working, you know, one of the things that you, uh, you, you are talking about, and I decided to take it uh, on board in my own personal life, it was that issue of to say, what do you use as an outlet to offload? And you know, during the the lockdown period, then I started uh, taking cooking as an uh, uh, as a as an outlet to offload. But to me, it was not just about cooking. 
it was, you know, I have to go research to say, if I do an ox tail, you know, this is how I saute my stuff. This is how I braise my ox tail. And, and, and for me, at the end of the day, when everybody was sitting there, enjoying my meal, my meal it, it, it added to my corporate, uh, to my muscle memory to say, you know, I've done something. It does not only benefit me. Uh, people are enjoying what I've done. Then I started, you know, reaching out to say, oh, this time is curry. There are these other things that I need to buy. To your point, even if you are offloading or you are using something as an outlet, take that and incorporate that into your muscle memory to say, okay, I've done something. And the beauty, it does not only benefit you, it benefits you and everybody who's partaking that. Because Jesus put it nicely, the greatest of all must be a servant. So it is not what you benefit out of that. Like we are talking about the lady with the cancer thing is that the more she watered others is the more that she watered herself because then you are no longer uh, preoccupied with self-saving interest, but you say that in my pain, how do I minister to others and make them better people? Wow. Wow. You know, yeah, that oxtail analogy also, I'm, I'm going to take it as a, it's an actual experience, but I'm going to take it and make it an analogy mm. that um, we, we face circumstances where we are in our own life's lockdown. Mm. And in that moment, we can choose to surrender to the situation or use it positively. Yes. So you, your outlet became a learning experience where you learned oxtail. But in order for you to, to do it properly, you had to invest in learning in, in studying, in getting the knowledge, in applying the knowledge and, and doing it right. Um, but it, even though it was an outlet for you, it became something that downstream, it benefited everybody else once your, your meal was prepared, once your meal was, was ready and, and scrumptious, that everyone was like, wow, this is delicious. So even the battles with face, they are not for us. I'm a firm believer that life does not happen to us, but life happens through us. Mm. That challenges, victories, losses, they are not happening to us, but they are happening through us, but for the benefit of others. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, every experience that you and I have gone through in our individual lives has given us a certain measure of lessons that we then imparted onto others. Um, I, I believe you cannot sufficiently or authoritatively teach someone about finances, about being in a bad financial state when you yourself have never been there. Otherwise, it's all just theoretical. Mm. Um, you cannot teach someone about forgiveness when you yourself have never been faced with a situation where you've had to forgive even the hardest thing that has happened in your life. So it's amazing that everything that we go through is not really for us, mm. but it is through us for others. Yo. As I'm listening to you here, I'm reminded again of the story of Joseph. 17-year-old Hebrew boy, a favorite in his father's eye. God talks to him through dreams, and that creates animosity in the family. Yeah. The family get to the point that his brothers say, no, man, we must do something to this boy. They throw him in the pit, then Reuben says, no. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Uh, you know, he go to a foreign land. He become obedient, not because he did anything wrong. It is just that his light was shining brighter than anybody else. You know, when he got there, again, he become obedient. Uh, he just goes on about his job. But uh, Potiphar's wife uh, thinks in the flesh, and he wants the boy to sleep with him. But because he had a greater purpose about his life and he was able to overcome that 
but not focusing on instant gratification. Get sentenced, goes and spend time in prison. Even in prison, the Bible say God was with him because he never carried that bitterness with him. Because I think to your point, the whole point of being afflicted is that out of that, uh, most people carry bitterness, unforgiveness, and to your point, it never benefits the greater population. The Bible say at an appointed time, somebody remembered to say, you know what, there's a guy there who's got the ability to do that. And he came, interpreted the dream, and he was able to avert seven years of famine, even when his brothers came to him. One of the scriptures that always resonate with me is that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yes. So, yeah, so to, to your point, every time when you are going through the challenges, uh, whoever becomes an agent of the enemy of them, he meant it for evil. But God always looks beyond that to say, my son, if you've got the uh, capacity to sustain what you are going through, at the end of the day, when people ask you, how did you meet me? You'll be able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I think that's where testimonies becomes practical to your point, to say, you cannot say you are a financial coach if you look at your financial status, it's all over the place. So you must it must first start with you. And they say, even when you are a preacher, preach first to yourself, then to others. And yes. I think yeah, you, are, you are raising a very good point to say, whatever is we are going through, we must go through it to benefit others. And people will be saying, no, this thing works. It's no longer theoretical, it's no longer fluffy, but people can see the pragmatic of what you are saying when it becomes a living reality. No, I, I like that expression. Yo, I like that because uh, you took that ox tail an analogy and you expanded it nicely and is to show that whatever you are going through, whether it's through lockdown, it is how we sustain our strength during that period so that it can benefit other people. It's, it's never for us. It is for us, for people that are around us, or is for the next generation. Because there's an expression that when wise men plant trees, they don't plant it for them, but they plant it for the next generation to enjoy the shades of those particular trees. So whatever we are doing in our lifetime, we might never benefit, but the next person will benefit based on the challenges that we had to endure. Yeah, you know, that you, you, you've you just, yeah, that's well said. Yeah. Um, and especially when you're touching about Joseph, I know that my wife also loves that story of Joseph and, and she would talk about it so many times and every time she would extrapolate different things out of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things out of that story is, is this profound lesson on forgiveness. Um, when you look at the time that Joseph was at Potiphar's was in Potiphar's house. He still had a thing of, I don't deserve to be here. I shouldn't be here. I was sold into slavery, but here I am. Okay, it's fine. I'll accept it, you know. And then unjustly he gets accused, and then he's thrown into prison. And when he says to these guys, guys, I'm I'm not supposed to be here. You know, I was falsely accused, blah, blah, blah. He goes on to this pity party. And and when the chief, uh, let me just, it's the chief butler. When yes. he goes out, he promised that he would remember, but then he forgets. Intentionally so, not on his part, <laughs> but because there's a part in Joseph that was not ready for where God had already taken him to, but he needed to just tap into that. And that was forgiveness and understanding that he is not the victim. Even though it was not part of his plan, it was still part of the plan. You know, he had a dream. He didn't know the how-to, but he, he was closer to the dream. But God needed his mind to be clear. So the moment he could accept that it was God who had led him to where he was. It was two full years 
and then God activated a dream in Faro that amazingly nobody else understood. But it was a dream only for Joseph. It, that dream was the key for Joseph mm. to come out of prison mm. and in, and launch him into his destiny. Into his destiny. So many of us are stuck in the era of I'm not supposed to be here. It, it's not my fault. Uh, it's it's this, it's that, it's that. But we fail to say, I forgive and I accept where I am. But in accepting, it doesn't mean that I want to stay. But I accept where I am and I accept that it, it is the will of God. And if it is the will of God, I he is going to take me through this into where he wants me to be. Classic example. Imagine if Jesus, while hanging at the cross, did not say or did not pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Imagine had he not said that. He would be dying with bitterness into wherever he had to go. Imagine that that that, that ministry being tainted by unforgiveness. You know, it would not have been as effective as it has been that we to this day enjoy those fruits. Sure. You know, uh, they say medical science has proven that there's a line of sight between unforgiveness and most of the diseases, that, things like cancer and all those things. And, you know, and I don't know, because if you look at most people, you know, take it into uh, most uh, marital problems and you unpack your root. You know, before we went live, we were just talking about building a relationship with a, with a girl child. In my case, I've only got three, so I don't have an opportunity to build a relationship with a boy. And But you see that most of the issues that we bring into uh, the institution of marriage, if you trace it back, most of them goes back to unforgiveness, to say maybe my father was not there when I grew up, then you become spiteful to the male figure that is in front of you, the inverse apply, by the way. And we can do that also from, from a male perspective. So I think the point that you are raising is that one of the things that can liberate our soul, that can set our souls free, is the ability to forgive when others offend us. Because if you don't do that, you know, the Bible is very clear. It says, darkness and light cannot coexist. Yes. They say the entrance of his word brings light. It means that it dispels darkness. And I think it's one of the things that if you look at your, even Stephen in the Bible, when the, the, the early church was birthed, they say Paul was there, by then he was sore. But when uh, God was witnessing this and Jesus, you know, Jesus even stood up because you know that he's seated. But they say for that event, uh, when Stephen looked up, he saw Jesus standing, you know, and Stephen said, uh, forgive them. And as a result, we don't know if he didn't mention that words, was Paul going to be the Paul that you are reading in, in the Bible? So one of the things that you are raising that I think can prepare us for the battles that are ahead is to be a pure vessel. Part of being a pure vessel is to say, you know, David will say, uh, create in me a new heart and search everything that does not belong to the attributes of your kingdom. And I think forgiveness goes a very long way. It helps you as an individual. To your point, if Joseph did not forgive his brothers, he did not forgive the butler, he did not forgive Potiphar's wife, was he going to be a prime minister? And you know, if Jesus, when he was uh, in between the two criminals and say, Father, forgive them and everybody else, was he going to do? Even when we look at the whole premise of Christianity, it is based on forgiveness because the Bible says if we come to him, he'll forget all our sins. So it is the cornerstone of everything because if you don't forgive, then in my view, you are blocking up anything positive that you are going to attract in your life. And I think, yeah, is a subject that is not dealt with, but in my view, is one of the fundamentals of preparing for that battle, to make sure that you forgive whoever has offended you, because the minute you are forgiving, you are letting go of all the toxicity that comes with that, and you are preparing yourself to launch into a new direction. Yeah, 
That's powerful. Um, you know, as as we close, um, I think I just want to reflect then on this morning thought that it it basically allows us to when when we take things in and we absorb them, it will allow us to to face battles head on. It will allow us to challenge the small battles so that we build that muscle memory. But above all, once we face the battle, and I think one of the things that the morning thought say, speaks about is when you've defeated someone, there's no need to gloat. Um, because when you gloat, it then becomes like a personal thing. But we need to understand that every battle that we're getting into, it's for a lesson. Once we win, we have created a muscle memory, we have created a testimony, um, we have learned what it's like to win. And we, I think there's honor in, in not gloating to your enemy or to the one whom you've defeated at that particular point, because it builds a certain character in you that you understand that the person and the victory or the person and the loss are two separate things. We don't attack the person, but we attack the situation uh, that we are confronted with. It may be a situation that comes with a person or a situation embodied in a person, but let us not attack a person. Let us attack the situation. Let us face the battle itself. And when we can learn to do that, we will be on our way to being, I love this principle of traveling light. We'll be on our way to traveling light. And when we travel light, we're able to take and let go of things along the way. So, Ndati Kavil, your closing thoughts. You know, my closing thought, they say the only thing that refused to be buried and comes back with the mourners from the cemetery is character. Yeah. So, Jesus passed on 2,000 years ago. What we are talking about now is his character. And my closing thoughts is that whatever we are going through, the end in mind is to make sure that we immortalize our character. Three generations down the line, they'll be able to see our great-great-grandfather, this is how he conducted his life. And that must always be top of mind. It is not about settling petty differences. After God grants you the victory, then you go and gloat. Because it's very clear, uh, the battle does not belong to us. It belongs to him. Meaning that when we get the results, it must never be about us. You must be able to point people back to the cross to say, all that I've achieved, all that I have, it is not because of me. And you know, like I said, I'm studying the book of John. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees will confront Jesus to say, you call yourself the bread of life. They say, you know what? Everything that I do and you see me doing, it is not me, but it is God in me. And he say, my food is to do the will of my father and is to finish it. May that be our testimony when we grasp our last breath and we close our eyes to say, I did it all but it, it was not me, it was Christ in me, hope of glory. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for making this time on a Sunday. Usually Sunday is like family day, but thank you for giving um, me your time to, to just share this with, with me. And, and I'm sure that everybody else who gets to watch this, they will be edified, they will be encouraged, um, and they'll keep pressing on. Um, I believe we are creating a legacy that's going to outlive us. Um, and I just want to thank you for the time and send my love and regards to your wife and the three lovely queens. Same applause, Baba Queen. Pass my regards to the family as well. And thank you very much for hosting me. And God bless you, sir, and everything that you do. To your point, this will benefit the bigger society. It's not between you and me is to, to water others as well. Thank you, Baba. Have a Thank blessed you. Sunday. Likewise, sir. Bye.